Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Hello, it's a great pleasure for us to have uh, Dr. Sandy Reagan uh, from Polytechnic Institute of NYU to come here and give a talk on uh, femtocell interference coordination and next generation wireless uh, systems. Uh, Dr. Reagan uh, got his uh, bachelor degree from University of Waterloo in Canada and uh, a master and PhD from uh, uh, UC Berkeley. Then he uh, basically uh, did a postdoc with the University of Michigan Ann Arbor, and uh, he co-founded the Flarian uh, Technology, uh, which is a spin-off of uh, Bell Labs. And uh, uh, they pioneered Flash OFDM, which is the first US uh, use of OFDM in cellular communication technology. Flarian uh, Technology get acquired by uh, Qualcomm. And uh, uh, Dr. Rangan then served as a director of engineering in Qualcomm, leading OFDM uh, uh, effort. And uh, recently, he just joined uh, Polytechnic Institute of NYU. Um, and uh, um, let's hear what Dr. Reagan can share with us on uh, femtocell uh, and other topics. Right. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. Jin, uh, for the introduction. This is, of course, my second time here at Microsoft Research. I was here before with uh, Qualcomm. Now I'm here uh, with a new Microsoft uh, template, PowerPoint template. Um, but the topic is still on wireless, although it's actually today I'm going to talk about femtocells. Now, Microsoft, of course, is not in the business of producing femtocells itself. But the motivations behind femtocells, namely a massive increase in the amount of wireless data traffic, is of really of interest to everybody involved in information and communications. So that's why I thought I would give a uh, talk about that here. So let me, I'm going to just start off the topic with um, the motivating trends behind femtocells. Now femtocells really um, offer a way to deploy networks much cheaper and possibly address the issue of this massive increase in data. But there's two basic challenges in getting femtocells to work. One is at the networking layer and the other is at, in interference. I'm only going to just briefly talk about the networking aspects, um, just to give you an uh, idea of the femtocell concept itself, but also just because it, uh, the way that the network architecture evolves has some impacts on the interference. The bulk of the talk will be on the way that we handle interference coordination. Now, interference, of course, is really a central problem in any wireless system. Anytime you connect more than two devices, they interfere with one another. So I want to start off with a bit of a historical perspective on the way that interference is managed in cellular systems, and to a lesser extent, I'll talk a little about Wi-Fi. And in particular, what we'll see here is that we really need to revisit with femtocells how interference is managed. And in particular, I want to in revisit the issue of frequency reuse, which is really the central principle behind the way that uh, interference is managed in cellular systems. Now, when we, the sort of researchy aspect will be in these two last subjects here. And when I want to take a look at the interference, I want to break it into two problems. One is just very briefly talk about femto and femtocell uh, interference and then femto and macro interference. And if I have time, what I'm going to do, this is, this is all still somewhat in the speculative domain and really needs, with a conclusion here, is validation. And validation actually with applications of actual application. And that's where I think the interaction with Microsoft will be interesting. And that'll make, I'll just talk a little briefly about how we might try to go about validating some of these concepts in a potential test bed. OK, so um, let me start off then with what we could say the wireless data crisis. So as all of you probably experienced right now, is that we're seeing an explosive demand in the amount of uh, wireless data use, particularly with the iPhone. But just uh, virtually every device is being realized right now could potentially benefit from internet connectivity. And the result of that is just a huge potential increase in the amount of demand that uh, wireless data devices are seeing. So this graph here, which you'll see show up in lots and lots of different presentations, is an estimate. Okay, you can take these estimates for what they are, um, from Cisco, which estimates as much as like a 38-fold increase from where we are now to where we are just by the age, year of 2014. 
And you can see that the bulk of that is from, it comes from a variety of sources. And some of this is fairly recent that we've come to learn, is that the bulk of it is coming from mo mobile video. The actual source of it won't be that relevant for the class here, for the talk here, but this will just give us some uh, understanding. It's good to have some understanding of where it's coming from. What was anticipated that would be a big hog, both in the wireline and wireless, is P2P. That does consume a lot, but it's actually video that's dominating. Now, actually, I used to be at a startup. And when I was at a startup, these kind of hockey six curves were always great. You would go to a venture or capitalist when you were in that little point here. And he said, OK, if you give me money, I'm going to like, expand your money by this huge amount here. But this is actually not what operators want to see, because this is the amount of demand. It is not the amount of potential revenue. So what operators are facing here is a situation where there could be an enormous increase in potentially in data, but it's not like the revenue from that data can increase that much. How much more revenue are operators going to get from wireless data services? Maybe 20, 30 extra dollars for an iPhone subscription a month. Maybe that's about 50% increase. Maybe that can even go up to, say, 100% increase. That's nothing like what you're getting here of a 38-fold increase. So what's going to have to happen, the bottom line conclusion, is you're going to have to decrease the cost of delivering data per bit down dramatically, usually somewhat orders of magnitude. Now, that's why they call this crisis. In fact, I've seen this graph with various things. One graph said uh, wireless data apocalypse. I mean, to be even more melodramatic and have this like arrow saying, you are here. You can, you know, maybe that's like too much, but it's definitely a situation that all operators are actually uh, incredibly worried about. Now, the only saving grace is that we've actually been through this before of trying to massively increase wireless data uh, um, in the past. And if you take a look at, let's say, um, the last 20 years, you know, going back to the, about the beginnings of when GSM was just being deployed in, in Europe. Actually, the amount of wireless data capacity has actually increased 4,000 fold, you know, depending on how you count the numbers, um, since that time. Now, how did, it's useful when you want to come up with that last 38 of thinking about how to, where did that capacity p could potentially come from. So capacity, you could think of a very simple formula coming from three different sources. One uh, source is that you can increase the number of bits per second per base station, right? So that's really the spectral efficiency. Now, all sort of, or most academic researchers work on that number, all right? So it's just increasing, you know, doing all the optimizations. That's my multiple antenna technologies, you know, better turbo codes, maybe better interference mitigation. All these te te uh, technologies contribute to this. So how much does all this academic and fancy techniques work and all the mathematics? Well, that's contributed not an insignificant amount, but seven. Seven out of that 4,000. Right? And that seven is extremely hard to uh, uh, get. You know, if I've been in the standard space where you know, an increase of, what, half a dB, which is maybe 10%, is actually very significant. Now, can we get another, can we get the bulk from this, uh, increasing this? Probably not. I mean, right now, we're already running very close to capacity. I think that we would get even another seven would be extremely doubtful. All right? So it has to come from two other things. Now, the two other things are actually relatively dumb. One is you can just buy more spectrum. And that actually accounts for about 10 times, uh, 10 of that factor uh, 4,000. But that, too, is probably, got, got, you know, there's only so much we can buy there. Although new possibilities, like things with cognitive uh, spectrum, might open up more. And I'll talk about that a little at the end. But the bulk of the increase has really just come from buying more base stations which is you know, what uh, cellular operators call cell splitting, because they're basically by taking a large cell and they're putting in lots of smaller cells, so they create uh, smaller ones there. So that is the bulk. So the, what's the lesson of this? If we want to get to our factor of 38 to meet Cisco's demand, that really we have to figure out a way to build base stations much, much cheaper. And that is what's motivating femtocells. What are femtocells are essentially small, personal base stations, and which are so an example of this femtocell is shown here on the right. This is one that they're already actually in production. There are several vendors. This is one from Huawei. And they're basically things that look about the same form factors you'd get with a wireless ac access point, about sitting on the dimensions of the top of your uh, desktop. Now, femtocells are actually just part of a trend. This, this, this desire to get smaller, cheaper base stations has been well known in the wireless industry. So if you look at a traditional uh, macrocellular tower, these things would go maybe 30 meters high with a large number of Zantella elements at the top. have already been in decrease well before the introduction of femtocells. For example, this is what's called a Nokia Metrosite 
uh, base station. This itself is a few, uh, several years old. That's about maybe one, one and a half meters high here. So these were already going to a smaller form factor. Femtocells are reducing that form factor much smaller and offer, for offering a much cheaper way of deploying these uh, base stations to try to get down those orders of magnitude numbers that we need. So the femtocell concept not, is not just different in the, uh, uh, in the form factor. The other important part about it is that it's deployed by the consumer in the consumer's president's uh, premises. So the idea of the architecture, just in this sort of uh, cartoon here, is that uh, you put a femtocell, just like you would attach a wireless access point, into, the pres into your home, and it would connect through your personal um, cable modem provider or whatever your local ISP is. And then ultimately through a gateway into the macros, into the operator's uh, backbone. But the important point about the femtocell is that it's using the operator's spectrum. So you're using the operator spectrum, but with a device that, uh, with a small device that you've put in in the backhaul yourself. So let's take a look. You can see here where the savings are potentially coming from for the operator. First of all, the cost of the femtocell, even if they have to subsidize it, is a much smaller device. Maybe about the size, you know, could be in the order of uh, like what an access point is, a few hundred dollars, as opposed to what a you know, macrocellular giant tower is, which is maybe, although the costs have come down, they're still probably around about, say, 50000 or something. The second part is that the actual backhaul is completely eliminated. You're subsidizing that yourself. The third part is that the actual core network is completely removed. Um, that you know, all the traffic can potentially go through, the, uh, through, the, uh, through your backhaul and then into the public internet with only some minor amount of management coming in, from the, uh, coming in through the uh, um, operator's network. And then the fourth part is just the deployment of it. A large part of the cost of running a big cellular network is the amount of tuning and the installation of the uh, cellular towers. And that is all eliminated because you're actually deploying that yourself. Yeah? So if I go outside my house and out of range of that box, I can't use it, right? Yeah, then you have to hand over. But that, if you can make that, so you'll hand over into the macrocellular network. Just from the user point of view, it looks very similar to having this Wi-Fi box currently at home. It talks to my broadband router and, and sends everything out over... Okay, yeah, so that's a good question. So the uh, question is what, what's really motivating the um, difference here between... Uh, from, but it's potentially, that it's actually debated, and a lot of people are, are saying that the femtocells just won't pick up, because anyway, Wi-Fi is already a perfectly acceptable situation in the home. So I think that the only real... And, you know, I think that it's not, it's not clear to me which one will actually win. But I think that if one's going to make an argument for femtocells, they're really of two forms. One is that if the wireless capacity in home was to get to such a high extent that even Wi-Fi was getting overburdened, which it isn't the case right now. Few people actually experience any practical data problems with Wi-Fi networks. Then femtocells might, because, they, because they're operating on a license spectrum with a much more efficient cellular tech, uh, standard, they could potentially offer higher data rates, if that's a problem. I don't think that argument is really that, uh, that valuable from a customer's perspective. Until, you know, maybe if everyone starts streaming HDTV or something in their home over Wi-Fi, maybe then it'll start to push the limits. The more important uh, aspect is this, that when it's actually outside your private home, if this is going to become a model that the, the operator will provide in public spaces, like in what maybe you could call Pico cells or something like this, where you know, it's a publicly, so not just that, when you're home, maybe you go to Wi-Fi, but what do you start to do when you start to roam and try to you know, go into a suburban mall or outside the house or an office building in these areas? And then this becomes, once it has to become managed by the operator, then the femto cells become much more attractive. That is municipal Wi-Fi. Okay, that's a good point. So, okay, when you, so what are you saving then? Now look at what's the, from the operator's perspective. It could either deploy a whole bunch of Wi-Fi access points or it could deploy a whole bunch of femtocell access points. Say the cost of the femtocell and the Wi-Fi access points are comparable or maybe even the femtocells are just slightly more expensive. So maybe the, the, what you're buying from getting a municipal Wi-Fi is getting a, maybe a slightly cheaper device. But what the advantage of femtocells are is because it's in, uh, um, works designed from the cellular perspective will have much easier um, coordination with one another and so the cost then can actually dramatically drop from the operator's perspective over Wi-Fi. Also things like mobility and other stuff are much better uh, operating in a cellular technology. So that's really what the most basis of using you know, femtocells potentially are over municipal Wi-Fi.
Because the dominant cost to the operators is going to be actually on the management of these devices much more than the actual cost. And anyway, the cost of femtocells is probably can be made comparable with what it is for Wi-Fi. There's other benefits also, you know, not that these can't be solved with Wi-Fi. The, you know, when you're looking at a mobile solution, then you really want things like power saving, roaming, paging, stuff like that. And those things are actually, right now, they run much less efficiently on Wi-Fi. For example, you know, cellular technology is much, much more power efficient, even, if, uh, even in active mode, but then particularly for things like sleep. And so that's, that's all those aspects. Once you, once you consider a system where you want ubiquitous coverage, which is what's obviously becoming the attraction for devices like the iPhone and stuff, that's when femtocells or picocells, are things that are operated in a potentially public domain, become an actually attractive solution. OK. Yeah? So does a femtocell cover a larger area than a Wi-Fi access point? It'll probably, can think of it as a, in principle, it could. But um, they'll probably run about the same um, power output as a wireless access point. So probably comparable the distance. You probably get a little bit better range because actually the cellular technologies have, can operate in much lower SINRs than, um, uh, uh, than uh, wireless access points. Wireless access points probably, you know, the lowest coding rates around like 1, 2 dB. And then because they actually don't handle fading that well, they, you know, they tend to clap out actually at much higher SNRs than that. And cellular technology has been designed from the beginning to work into very, very low SNR regimes. So you can get a push out the range a little bit better. OK. Also, there's other issues you can, um, you know, in a, in a wireless access point, the minimum amount of bandwidth you have to transmit is over 20 megahertz. And in the cellular technology, if, you know, because it's been designed to handle things like voice, you can, uh, you know, access a very small portion of that bandwidth if you're you know, needing a low rate connection. So the range would definitely be better. But so there's, you know, you could argue that on, you know, because it's a cellular technology, it's more advanced that you'll get a, just a general link layer improvement. But again, I'm not so sure that's a big enough selling feature itself to for people to adopt wireless uh, to flip out Wi-Fi access points. It's not like people complain that much about the range of their Wi-Fi devices. So I mean, if I just operate, I would try to get more money out of me because I'm using a spectrum. But if I am within the home and the ubiquity story is not there, I am not willing to pay more because Wi-Fi serves my purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I don't really think that, I mean, operators are trying to do this right now with the way they're deploying femtocells. I don't think it's going to fly and the numbers are showing it. That, you know, if you actually charge even a nominal amount for people to buy a femtocell, people are probably not going to buy it. The only case where people are going to buy it is they want to get cell phone coverage for their voice service in home. For some reason, their house isn't getting a good coverage, so then they put one of these femtocells in. And you know, that only is, that has a limited amount of value, and it's not really the data then is an issue. So I don't think, you know, I think the reality is that if operators, this technology is to be deployed, they'll have to give it away pretty much for free. But you know, if you believe the story that it can offer this tremendous amount of increase in data and offload it, you know, capacity off the wire, you know, uh, operators networks, then they should give it away for free, which I, you know, if femto cells take off, that's what will probably happen. Okay, so let's see a little more details then about uh, femto cells. So we've got uh, talked about a little about this. So if you compare sort of macro cells with femto or pico cells, you can compare them in a number of different categories. So one aspect is just the cell size. So cell size is, you know, in a typical suburban environments around right now for macro, about half a kilometer, two kilometer site distance, although the specs usually allow very large cells for, uh, you know, rural areas, like up to 60 kilometers. Femto cells, you're looking at their coverage that's much more like a Wi-Fi area, even if they were to be deployed publicly. So the meaning so they're typically less than about 300 meters, probably often even much less than that. Um, the deployment, the, so the first part where we see the um, big cost savings is in deployment. So the macrocellular uh, model for deployment is that it's of course planned and managed by the operator. Now if you've actually been to an operator, you know the incredible amount of effort, they, um, painstaking effort, they go through to deploying a macrocellular tower. When I say planned, it means the following, that you have an, a bunch of RF engineers who do a very detailed similar RF simulation to uh, pick where the cell site is uh, going to be placed. Then they have a real estate team which goes out and actually negotiates a contract to actually deploy the uh, antenna somewhere. And then they install their services on that and go through an elaborate process of down tilting the antennas, driving around and testing it to get everything perfect. I've been through that myself and it's just an incredibly painstaking um, uh, process. The uh, femtocell 
uh, comes at much cheaper. It's deployed much just like you would deploy an uh, access point. So you open up a box, your customer installs it, plugs it in, and deploys it wherever their customer wants. So that whole cost of deployment is just eliminated from the operator, which is at a huge part. And even if the operator were to maintain this, in principle, it will have a much more plug and play kind of deployment model at a greatly reduced cost to the operator. The second part, um, the part that is well, the same though, is the, on the air itself, that the spectrum and actually the air interface technology for the most part are completely the same as the cellular part. So it's deployed by the customer, but it's using the operator's uh, uh, spectrum. Um, another difference, of course, is that the macrocellular tends to use multiple sectors. So what you'll have is, you saw that picture actually of the uh, tower. So what happens is that the towers actually radiate, have several antenna elements, usually three, radiating like a 120 degree arc into each sector. So that's to get improved efficiency. Here to just make it cost is just a single sector omnidirectional antenna. Um, the backhaul is the second part of the uh, savings uh, picture. The uh, big cost to the operators is the backhaul. And it was already a cost when they were running just these 3G systems, which run maybe, uh, or the, a few years ago anywhere, running up to them only about 2 megabits per second. The 4G center systems and even the later releases of the 3G systems are going pushing over 100 megabits per second in principle. And those backhaul costs could actually be tremendous, and it's not clear where the money is going to come from. If the, um, in the femtocell model, that can in principle be entirely uh, released so that it can just go to, say, a subscriber's local ISP. Um, the RF, in terms of the actual, the other part that's reducing cost is just the form factor, as I said, and just the overall cost. So if you look at the radio frequency components in a macrocellular tower, you're talking about like a 20, usually about 20 watts per sector. So with multiple sectors, it can go up to 100 watts. And you know, if you actually see those things, they're just giant like refrigerator cabinets part, uh, uh, boxes. And the reason is that to get that and pump that amount of power, you need what are called these power amplifiers, large power amplifiers. Like a PA will be about you know, maybe this, but that big, and it's actually pretty heavy. And then we need one another one on the received side of the low noise amplifier, and they, then they stick it a rack. And then there's all sorts of other costs that come associated with that. You need cooling trays. You need very big cables, because you don't want to have any cable loss when you're trying to run this kind of power up to your uh, uh, antenna element. On the other hand, a femtocell is usually much smaller, about 0.1 watts to around maybe 1 watt at the absolute most. So it's kind of similar to what you'd get on a wireless terminal, which means, you know, if you look at that, this is a single RF chip, it comes very cheap, maybe a few bucks that can get installed. So it's just a radically different part. The other part of the cost savings is that the macrocellular environment is usually uh, servicing hundreds of users, usually for voice, and that comes with all sorts of computational complexity. The femtocell is much smaller, like a Wi-Fi access point, maybe around like 4 to 32. And 32 is typically even, that number is fairly high. On the other hand, you're not sacrificing on the data rates. You still want to get those peak data rates up there. Yeah? From a user's point of view, would it save battery life to go over Wi-Fi, definitely. On the terminal side, it would, because, well, at least right now. Now, I don't, you know, there are probably fixes in the dot eleven spec, but <clears throat> the dot eleven spec is just, it's actually very, very um, battery intensive for two reasons. While you're actually transmitting, it's just a very inefficient actual mechanism for transmitting. You're transmitting over a very wide band where you have to constantly be doing these chip level searches which actually guzzle batteries and uh, battery power itself. But then also when you go into a sleep mode, it becomes even more expensive in, uh, in, a, in Wi-Fi because cellular technologies have very, very highly optimized sleep for battery life so that you can keep your phone on and it can pick up a call anytime. So they have very efficient ways to just wake up for a very small amount of time, check if it's being paged, and then go back to sleep. Those mechanisms, they can be added into Wi-Fi, but they're not, uh, you know, they're not, they still don't get the same kind of levels of efficiency that you would get. Actually, it was oh, sorry. Wi-Fi and, and, and Femto cell, but between Femto and Macro. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, you would save batteries to some degree, but not much. You would save the battery power in that you'd be closer to the base station. So that way you would get, but maybe not that. But that's, it would be significant. Uh, the bulk of, on a modern smartphone, the bulk of the, the battery drains actually on the display more than the, um, more than the bulk of the battery drains on the display more than the RF component. But even on the modem, actually, like their talk time, it would, it would decrease it a little bit by dropping it. But even that, maybe, you know, maybe if you're close, I'm not sure what the number is. I'm going to take a hazard guess like 20, 30 percent or something like that if you're right beside the access point versus away from the comment on the coverage of uh, between the pickle sale versus the uh, marco sale i mean if let's say pickle sale really take off 
would significantly enhance the coverage uh, space? Yeah, so coverage is just a matter of function of like the number of uh, you know, Pico cells you can deploy. So if your total data rate, you know, it's... But because Pico cell may not be planned that well, right? I mean, Femto and Pico are not planned that well. I mean, you may create holes in the... That's a very good point, yeah. So, okay, so what, what's going to happen is, so you're, the, the fear is that you're, because, of course, you're making a, you're making a trade-off, you put on an unplanned deployment, and I'll, that's what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this talk. Because you're going to an unplanned deployment, so now you can get many more base stations, but how much does the capacity per base station go down? Is that your question? Yeah. So that's what we'll talk about in, in this talk. And the ba basic conclusion is that there is going to be a loss, but if we do the right things, that loss is not so bad, and that, you know, that loss is not so bad, and we can handle those sort of smaller corner cases where it does fail very badly, and in which case then we'll still get a lot of the benefits from these radically cheaper base stations. So. Some of these benefits you mentioned, the energy part, and maybe some of the data rates, it could even take off as a, a home technology independent of operator involvement. Yeah, but because it's used, it, it has to have operator involvement because at least... It, okay. Although uh, many of these ideas, if they're popular, from, if there's enough benefits on the link layer side, then people could try to think about new ways to do unlicensed spectrum. And you know, if those ideas on the air interface side are actually good, then you could think of new ways to do it. unlicensed spectrum and to get those benefits themselves. Okay, so those are the benefits. But here's sort of a high level understanding of where the challenges are to get this. And so a lot of challenges are coming from basically the fact that this is an, almost like an ad hoc deployment. Now ad hoc, of course, to computer scientists usually means sort of uh, distributed routing. That's not the sense in which I mean it here, just in the sense of unplanned deployments without the careful planning that an operator usually provides. And there's really sort of two um, or really three ways in which the, uh, these kind of manifest themselves. The first is in the interference environment itself. So you have, as I said, it's an unplanned deployment, but also there's just the interaction between the macro and femto cell. To get the, no one is going to deploy the femto cells on dedicated spectrum, at least not initially, because the uh, demand is not there yet. And anyway, it would be very spectrally inefficient to do that. So they're going to be sharing the same spectrum as the macro and in the femto. And when you try to do this, there's a sort of a fundamental difficulty here, because there's a large power disparity between the macro and femto, and I'll talk about that. The other problem, difficulty, though, which makes femto cells particularly challenging is what's called restricted association. A key principle in the way that cellular networks are deployed is that the terminals can connect always to the closest um, base station, and that's what makes the cellular networks work. That may not be the case in the femtocell, because you may not want somebody else to connect to your femtocell. And as a result, you have this idea of a restricted association, and that creates many of the really difficult adverse interference environment. A second problem just is really just the need for self-configuration, as I said. If we're going to get savings, these things have to be kind of just plug, plug and play. And that has issues both with terms of synchronization at just a physical layer, because we need, for example, to need synchronization to smooth the handovers between the macro and Fepto, but then also some kind of synchronization for interference mitigation techniques. Plus, you also need other parts, which I won't talk about in this thing, just for actually the uh, way that the uh, devices are managed through the operator and so on. And the third part is really just the networking aspects, because no longer in the previous part, the networks were completely under the operator's control. Now it's a mixture of uh, a network, partly going through a local ISP, partly going through a public internet, and then finally into the operator. Then how do we try to do that? So I'll only talk a little about this. Um, I just want to talk a little bit uh, just about the standardization efforts. Um, yeah? Right, so when you talked about the ubiquitous mode of rent to sell yeah. outside the house, is a handoff a, a new challenge because now it will be more frequent as I travel? Or? Absolutely, absolutely. But okay, on the other hand, where you're going to likely have the density of it will be probably in areas where the velocity will be smaller. But definitely the handover is an issue. Actually, the handover is an issue partly because of the, uh, partly because of the uh, smaller cells, so you'll be handing off more frequently. But then also the issue of that you're handing over over multiple different networking domains. You know, potentially handing off over one person, you know, femtocell connect into one ISP, into another femtocell, into another ISP, and so on. I won't talk too much about that, but that's definitely an issue. Okay, so um, I wanted to do this, this slide here just because I'm going to be throwing around some of these acronyms. And by the way, I did this. unfortunately, this field is just 
filled with acronyms. So if you ever see an acronym that you don't understand, just raise your hand and I'll, uh, I'll uh, um, tell you. So femtocells are really just part of an evolution which um, you can, and it's just good to see it in the perspective of the evolution of uh, cellular systems more generally. So generally uh, uh, cellular systems are characterized in what's called you know, 2G, 3G, and 4G. So 2G systems generally refer to the first digital voice systems like back into GSM, which were narrowband systems. Now, I put a range of data rates. That's actually, that range is really, the beginning number is sort of the original data rates into the first releases of the spec. And as you can see, all of these systems, are, you know, it's not like it ended its evolution here. They're continuing to evolve. So you know, the GSM edge systems now actually get, actually that numbers even old right now they have like a two megabit version of uh, of these or um, G of edge of, of edge systems in 3g systems were systems which were really the first generation of really the first uh, data based uh, systems were actually the first service that actually offered packet service uh, um, services and you know broadband uh, data rates so those began in around 2000 and you know they were originally around about 384 kilobits but now in the later releases will get you know very high data rates um, Finally, the uh, 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 fourth generation systems are what's called long-term evolution. And these are systems that are really offering allegedly much higher, even higher data rates than that and lower latency. Now, I wanted to put this here because a lot of the, uh, I'm going to talk mostly about femtocells in the context of LTE. And when, fe when LTE was actually in its planning stage back in about 2005, a lot of these, uh, a lot of the benefits that people thought were moving from CD, uh, LTE is an OFDM-based system as opposed to a CDAA system. A lot of the benefits that people really thought of that LTE would have have really have not become really that valuable. One of the benefits here was the very high data rates. Well, the very high data rates, first of all, UMTS actually was able to increase its data rates within the system itself. And anyway, those very high peak data rates are not really that possible in a macrocellular system. Those are only possible if you have four antennas, how many uh, devices have four antennas. And you know, and you're in a situation that you're very close to the base station, which is not going to happen. You know, the low latency, sure, the low the latency is good. But anyway, UMTS draw, dropped down its delays down to 30, 40 milliseconds. So maybe that delay isn't uh, that much. Where the benefit, though, from LTE, now it's becoming increasingly realized, is actually much more in the femtocell context. So, and that wasn't something that was necessarily obvious when people started to design the system back you know, in 2005. So a lot of these benefits you can see are actually very valuable in the femtocell context. Okay, the data rates are not valuable in the macrocell because you're not going to get them, but actually in a femtocell case, it is very possible to, uh, it is very possible to get these very high data rates in that environment. The other aspect of it, which is this always on IP connectivity, and actually more generally just an IP, all IP backhaul. That actually we'll see here really facilitates the easy networking between a local and private ISP and a um, public ISP. And the other part about uh, LTE, which we'll talk about uh, later, is on terms of uh, the actual interference coordination. It's really in that domain that LTE really excels over CDMA systems because of a key concept which we'll talk about is subband scheduling. So um, while LTE really was promoted and initially pushed as a way to try to increase capacity in the macro cell environment, its gains are not that significant. But actually it's in the femtocell or just more generally in the um, uh, situation of what's called heterogeneous networks where LTE will really excel. And that's kind of why I want to talk about it in the context of LTE. Um, just a little bit uh, in terms of dates here. The actual work on femtocells began before the uh, standardization of LTE. Well, while LTE was going on, it was from very pretty early on that people started talking about um, femtocell aspects back in 2006 in 3G and 2007 in 4G. And so, and as I said, now there's an increasing amount. A lot of the effort that working on standardization for future releases of the technology have really focused on femtocells. There are other groups involved, and I just put one of them here, which is called the Femto Forum. So you'll see some of the references to their work here. All right, so let me talk just briefly about the network architecture. It's not really my area of expertise, so that's why I'll skip over it a little bit. But also just uh, wanted to only talk about it just so you, you give, got an idea of the femtocell concept. Okay, so this is one of the alphabet soup kind of slides, unfortunately. So if you don't remember any of these acronyms, it's really not, don't worry too much. Um, actually, if you see pictures of network architecture for LTE, they're even much more hideous than this. They have like, you know, 10,000 boxes of different uh, sorts. I've just picked out a few which to... Uh, 
to um, simplify it. So, okay, the first acronym we're going to learn is um, the device itself. That's called the user equipment. I've put a cell phone, but that could be any PDA or it could actually be a wireless laptop or anything like that. Anything that's connect getting connectivity from the internet. The base stations have a uh, ridiculous acronym called E Node B. The E stands for evolved because the previous generation was called Node B for a reason that makes absolutely no sense to me. But that's the, um, that's the uh, name. So this is a Microsoft environment. And the set of them is called the EUTRAN as another ridiculous acronym. All right? So it's called the Evolved Universal Terrestrial Radio Access Network. All right. So that's the base station. Everything behind that is the core network. So in the core network, in the user plane, which is where the data is actually coming from, the two um, important boxes are called the serving gateway and the packet data network gateway. The packet data network was the key box, and that's the L3 point of attachment. So on, in terms of IP routing, that is the first point of connectivity. If you were to do a trace route after your connection is up, the first box you would see is the IP address of the PDN gateway. Everything from there would be really you could consider as L2 routing. Now what's specifically happening is that when the, uh, uh, data arrives in from the public internet, it's classified into what's called an EPS bearer. All right, a bearer is something which is um, specific to the UE, and the UE might have multiple bearers to reflect different quality of services for different uh, uh, IP traffic. And it's mapped to one of these EPS bearers. And then all the routing between the PDN gateway and the UZ equipment is based on that EPS bearer. So none of these other boxes in between here have any concept of the UE's IP address. So there's, it's all L2 routing. Now, of course, there can be IP routing as part in uh, parts of this, like there's this GDP tunnel between the PDN gateway and the base station. But that's actually transparent to this end-to-end -end connection. That's just an IP connection between the PDN gateway and the, uh, and the base station. All right. Can I some film questions? Yeah. So in this case, let's say the UE has an IP address. Yes. Is that IP address associated with the gateway? I mean, basically, who has that? I mean, since you, you mentioned that most of the intermediate basically node only have this information of the right. EPS pair, right? Right. So who has the information? Only the PDA gateway. Only the gateway. Yeah, that's right. So the, you actually, when you do D8, so you get a, your L2 connection will come up. Then you'll, you know, if there's a Windows device, you'll get a media up. You'll run DHCP here. And then that DHCP server is running in the PDN gateway. So the PDN gateway will give you the IP address. Okay. Um, the ES is yeah. that only one, or you potentially can have several? You have several. So you actually have one for every type of quality of service. So typically, you know, your internet traffic will run on, say, one EPS bearer. But then if you were to have for, let's say, IMS voice or maybe video conferencing or something like that, if it was not running as a best effort service that the operator was trying to deliver, then they would probably deliver it on another EPS bearer to give it, say, higher quality of service. And that EPS bearer will be understood by the base station and all the uh, basic, That's basic unit That's on there. Okay. Yes. So when that traffic gets routed here, it comes with, it says, this is the, essentially the MAC address. Okay, though it's not a type, it's a different MAC address than what you would have in Wi-Fi. And this is the bearer ID for that MAC address. So this is the third bearer. This traffic is on the third bearer of that. How is the uh, quality of service of power routing handled in those base stations? So, I mean, Basically, let's say the base station is associated with 10 UEs, and each of them is running different right. applications. Right. Because the traffic comes in here marked with a bearer, and then the bearer will have some quality of service profile. So then it can schedule the um, one, tra one bearer's traffic in, uh, you know, with relative priority to another bearer's okay. traffic. So it'll maintain a queue for every bearer. So actually, so there'll be a set of queues for every UE, and then within the UE, one queue for every bearer of that UE. And then when it does the scheduling, it'll pick from, you know, presumably it'll, it'll can tend to favor higher priority queues over lower priority queues. I mean, in, for example, in routers, Cisco routers, right. I mean, basically, uh, I, I think basically there's, I mean, basically people talk about basically. Diff serve. Uh, yeah, diff serve, and uh, basically the implementation is basically uh, uh, weighted fair queuing. Uh, yes. Basically something like that. That's right. Is those basically information available on how absolutely. the... Absolutely. Uh, you mean for the air link scheduling? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So you can do, and they very much you can do those kind of things. They can do uh, maximum weight matching or any type. So you have a bunch of queues. You have a priority policy on every queue, and then you can do it. The wireless scheduling actually has 
is more complicated typically than the switch scheduling problem because the scheduling decisions you're making at one base station, and that's what I'll talk about in this talk, will have some influence on the scheduling decisions here because they could change the interference conditions. So it becomes a more complicated problem. Also because the channel rates themselves change over time. So there are other things you can get like what's called multi-user diversity. You can try to schedule not just based on priority but when the actual channel is better versus when the channel is worse and you can play these kind of games. All these kind of games which can happen in scheduling in a wireless link that won't happen in a, in a wireline link. Uh, another question, EPS bearers. Uh, this bearer, is there any way um, the application on the UE or on the host side can influence this bearer basically tell you? Okay, yeah, so that's, that's the part here. So the operator will what it's how the traffic will get uh, categorized. Now, I, the way that it's been done so far is that you know everything from the public internet that you go, whether you go to YouTube or CNN or something like this, they're all just categorized as generally a best effort yeah. bearer. In principle, though, and then the operator services, if they were to deploy IP-based services, okay. let's say like IMS Voice or something, they could classify them onto a separate bearer. Okay. Now, there's nothing though prohibiting the operator aside from things like network neutrality or something like this, they could say they could make a contract with CNN and say, okay, if your, my client goes to uh, CNN service, I will then, you know, based on the source IP address of the server or something, I'm going to classify that separately and maybe give that higher priority if CNN gives me some money. So that could happen. You know, or that you know, maybe it can also, from the port number, recognize that this is a VoIP application. And if they want to be nice, but they probably don't, but if they wanted to be nice to say Skype or something, they could probably pick that up from doing some packet inspection and then give that higher priority. But maybe they, don't, they probably don't want to be nice. Or worse, or worse, yeah, that's right. <laughs> You know, I, I, th that's actually a whole opening, open part because mm -hmm. another aspect which I'm not talking about here is the way that these networks is funding is probably through a much more sophisticated, um, sophisticated uh, uh, model, pricing model with the content providers. Mm -hmm. Most people have looked at content, the pricing with the subscribers, mm -hmm. but it's you know not unreasonable that the content providers could provide a lot of the funding for these networks and that operators with this system could leverage their ability to provide different quality of services by the way it's mar you know, marked in the uh, PDN gateway. Um, basically one further question is, I know in LTE they're talking about the broadcast mode, right? Yes. And uh, um, how is that handled? Uh, is any basically provider is deploying broadcasting mode into the I do believe I, I do believe that it definitely handles as a whole part of the thing was called multi and broadcast mode. That can be that can absolutely be supported. And I believe that the broadcast will also go into the PDN gateway here and then map to a multicast ID, much like okay. uh, and then so there will be some kind of multicast bearers here. And then the user basically or the users will can get that. Pick up That's right. Okay. And then the scheduler when it comes to the base station can do something intelligent. It can try to send the data to the ones with the it'll know the channel quality to all those users and then pick one that'll make it work for all of them. Um, are you aware of any providers using that service for, I mean, Well, LTE itself hasn't been deployed yet. Okay, okay. You know, so, but presumably once it's deployed, it will be, because they're already doing that with the 3G systems right, right now. Okay. So they already, like, Verizon does some kind of time slotting basis for some of its things, like I think the VCAS and stuff go through some kind of time slotting. So I presume that it will get, it will definitely get used. But, you know, as we were talking about in the morning, you know, how much will be multicast versus how much will be on-demand viewing? And if on-demand viewing is the one that, you know, operators are really worried about, and, yeah. Um, yeah, I think you answered my question. It was just basically like how the PDN gateway will classify different types of traffic. Yeah. So, so it's based on you know based on something like a port number and yeah. uh, um, you know. You know that's a good question. I think a PDN gateway could serve in probably in the neighborhood. I'm thinking of like tens of. Uh, uh, you know, tens of base stations. But you know, what will happen in these network architects with not new network architects with hundreds of megabits per second going to potentially to each base station is, you know, it's not clear. And with the femtocell case, well, then the scaling issue becomes totally different. Now potentially they're thinking of hundreds of base stations per PDN gateway. So then we need something, you know, very different on the uh, network. So, okay, yeah. Uh, address translation at the PDN gateway also. Oh, the NAT. So if you get, if you say, say you know, the NAT would probably, suppose you, instead of having a user equipment here, you then break this out. To have, so you probably, my understanding, is that if you were, to, you would get the same, much, it'll probably be much like 
what would happen right now with a cable modem provider. So you would run right now NAT at the, um, I guess you run it probably at your cable modem. So you'll get one public IP address from the, uh, from the operator and then if you want to break that out you can do network address translation into your private network in your private network at the, on the customer's premises. The same would happen here. You'll get from the PDN gateway a, public IP, a single public IP address. Or maybe you know, they can offer to offer multiple IP addresses if they wanted to do that. And then you, if you, in your private. Is that your question? Yeah. So the NAT runs, the NAT runs at the customers. Um, some basic sort. Currently, most of those gateways are they run on IPv4 or v6? They will. They, the, the specs all spec out IPv6. Okay. Now, how much of their how much of their operating networks right now are IPv6? I'm not sure. But the, all these um, all, all these all these run uh, all the protocols are, are compatible with IPv6. They also um, for I'm not going to talk about it here, but for uh, they to do the uh, you also want to be able to do handovers. IP mobility between from non 3GP to 3GPP, and that will, they'll generally run either mobile IP, and that's also supported. Either uh, they'll either run a dual stack um, IP, uh, IPv6 and IP4, or they'll use proxy mobile IP, depending if it wants to be network managed or you want to. And that'll also run in that does that also supports v6. Okay, so that was the that was a sort of high level picture of um, the macro network. Let's take a look at what happens in the femtocell network. So in the femtocell network, what happens is you don't um, uh, directly talk again with the serving gateway. Instead, what you go through is what's called a home e node b gateway. So the home e node b gateway is really the connection between the operator's core network and the public uh, internet. All right. So you're you're connected here to your uh, home e node B. It's, a, it's called the home e node B. Remember, e node B is base station. So home e node B, all right, is the is your femtocell. So I've kind of drawn it in a little bit uh, different picture here. So there's a home e node B, which will be connected to your local ISB, which will then go out to the public internet and then go to the home e node B. Go away. The home e node B, where you can think of it as kind of like a concentrator. What it'll do is it'll just concentrate the traffic. Um, concentrate the traffic from multiple home enobies. But essentially that connection is essentially transparent. So really it looks logically like a connection directly to, the, to this, uh, this uh, serving gateway. Now I put this up just to uh, show you the uh, picture here. The, the, uh, your L3 point of attachment is still the PDN gateway. Now what this means here is that your home enobi when it comes up, it will get an IP address actually from the local ISP. But that is not, again, you don't see that IP address. So your home enobi gets a local uh, IP address from the um, local ISP, will then get a connection to the uh, serving gate, uh, well, actually get its IP connection there goes to the, uh, uh, well, it has a, it has a um, connection here to the serving gateway. But if you, again, if you did a trace route, all right, you're still your L3 point of attachment is here. Now, this actually, so if you were to um, ping, all right, the home enobi's IP address, you know, right? Well, the way I've drawn it here, you will go through this kind of ridiculous route. Your L3 point of attachment is the PDN gateway, all right? So you will go through your home enobi, who doesn't even know that, because he doesn't expect your traffic that is coming to him. He will just forward it along, you know, la -la, through the ISP, through the public internet, home enobi way, through the, then to the PDN way. He gets through the PDN gateway, then, uh, uh, no, it doesn't go back this way. This is a public internet address, so it goes out through here because he's, he's dumb and doesn't even recognize that it's on his network, right? So that's the way that would work. Now, um, I'll talk about that in a second to solve that problem, but I just want to point out, uh, one big difference, though, between this. So aside from this uh, uh, ENOB concentrator here, one of the things here that you see between macro cells is this X2 interface. Now, in LTE, they provide an X2 interface. Part of that is just for handover to do tunneling if you go from one base station to another. But the important as other aspect is for, in X is for interfer intercell interference coordination. So there's actually control messages that are going back between the base stations to coordinate the interference. Like you could say, oh, I have a UE that I'm trying to serve. Can you try to vacate this part of the spectrum because this part, you know, I need this to serve this mobile and so on. So all that kind of information is there in the X2. That is no longer possible in the home enobi because they just thought it was not scalable or to, you know, logistically difficult to try to develop an X2 interface because you'd have to find the other enobis and so on, home enobis. Now, because of that, that will present some challenges for intercell interference coordination. I'll try to address that in the end of the talk. Is the question, is X2 running over the air or over the wire? That's wired. The X2 is wired. Okay, so just to get around that absurd problem. Um, of course, the big issue that, you know, part of the selling point of is to offload traffic 
off the um, off the operator's network. So that you know, if it has everything has to go through the operator's core network, that wouldn't be good. So the way that it's typically will likely be deployed is with one of these variants. One's called Lipa and one's called Sipto. Okay, so let's go again. The traditional IP path would be because this is your home UE. If you're wondering what that stands for, all right. If you're normally, as I said, goes through your local ISP through the public internet and goes there into the cellular core network, and that's your first point of attachment. So that's if you want to get, from, say, from YouTube, you go this route here, all right, which is obviously not good from the customer's perspective and is not good from the operator's perspective either because the, uh, um, you're, you're eating up capacity here. And that's particularly bad because these can be very high uh, uh, capacity links. So instead, what they're working on are two uh, different solutions. One is what's called selected IP traffic offload, which is to create a connect direct connection. Now, to do that, though, you need an L3 point of attachment in the uh, homey node B itself. So they have this version of what's called a local PDN gateway. And there's a variety that's still being spec'd out to try to figure out how to do this. There's different variants of this, but that's, this is one solution here that I've driven here. That local PDN gateway can also be used for what's called local IP access. So for example, I put a here a, a you know, whatever, flat panel screen here. So you can imagine you're trying to uh, stream wireless data from maybe some kind of laptop onto that screen. So now that could run over this local IP uh, gateway here. The actual way it's going to be solved, there are a lot of technical issues to try to uh, deal with this. You know, just basically cover the case of how you do handoff, how you do security, and so on. Um, those are still being worked out, but they will likely you know, be part of the femto cell situation. All right? Is there any need for anything besides like voice traffic to go inside their core network? No, really there isn't. That's the point. Really, in principle, you could imagine that everything would get, uh, everything could get offloaded, except for control messaging and like the authentication and uh, you know, operator management. But in principle, the overwhelming majority can, get just, you can drop it off, unless it's the operators providing the services like you said, and stuff like IMS voice or something like that. OK, um, another issue, I'm not going to talk about it much, but just to give a picture of it, is the security. Because now I, I put this up just because um, for traditional, uh, in the traditional uh, macrocellular deployment, it's been uh, assumed that everything, the whole backhaul core network, that's everything from the uh, cell towers and all the network element boxes is, is trusted and secure. And so actually, your data runs unencrypted. All right. It's encrypted, of course, when it goes over the air, but it's decrypted and then it's not encrypted anywhere else in the core network. So if you were to tap into a macrocellular tower right now, you would read everything into clear. Now, that's not, uh, not a problem in an operator, potentially not a problem in an operator network. And that had a lot of performance benefits by not having to do the encryption over the backhaul. Of course, that's not possible in the, in the femtocell situation. So generally what they do is they put a, what's called a security gateway that, that would access as a, you know, between the untrusted public internet and a trusted IP network. And then you run uh, actual uh, security, uh, the IPsec over this, which is so it's actually encrypted at the security or decrypted here. I know, again, there's a, just a huge number. Actually, the evolution of security is much like what happened, you'll see in the, you know, when they began to realize problems with web-based security, they added some ungodly, what, like 200 pages of spec into the, you know, if you read the .11 2007 spec, so you'll see like 2000, 200 pages of specs on security. It's actually had a similar problem in 3GPP, there are now like 17 specs, just on all sorts of varieties of problems with security. So, I, you know, obviously I'm not going to address that here. All right. So let's go on to uh, the top main topic here, which is just on interference. Actually, how much time? I'm actually run, burned out an hour. Of wasting. OK, so you know, I'll just talk a little. That was, that was. I mean, we can basically move all of this question yeah. to our own okay. conference. So you know, I'll just skip over a little bit about this. I'll just skip through a couple of the slides. <laughs> so this was the bulk, but we'll just talk about it. So, um, the other key problem in uh, femto cells is the problem of interference. So this picture um, was really taken from one of the specs on a bunch of different interference scenarios that you're having. Essentially, of course, interference is really the central problem, as I said, in any wireless network. Um, it's any, you will have interference whenever there are more than two connections. And in fact, if there wasn't interference, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems we have. We'd just be dealing addressing with point-to-point -point links. But we have interference. But femto cells really create particularly challenging interference problems, as I said, for a few reasons. The deployment's unplanned, the cells uh, may be restricted, and there's these issues of the macro femto overlay. In addition to that, there's a desire to really make the adaptation very fast. 
So entry into cell in fear problem can be uh, uh, solved by appropriate adaptation, but then the question is you want to do that quickly, and you want to do that quickly because the key to the game of uh, using the air link efficiently is to be able to dynamically allocate resources back very fast, and that's particularly needed for low latency or bursty traffic. I should just point out that really femtocells, uh, the issues of phasing femtocells are similar for more generally for what is called heterogeneous networks, or this term hetnets, which you'll see a lot in the cellular uh, space. And then, you know, they're mixtures of femtos, macros, but also other elements like relays, and then also mixtures of types of spectrums, like between the non-cellular part. So these are all sorts of issues that uh, operators are deploying, uh, facing. Now, broadly speaking, really, you can think of this two ways to deal with interference. Um, at least in a simple way. One is uh, what's called, one is the traditional cellular method, which is power control. All right? And um, so power control is, is, is this, well, with reuse one. It's basically every, here are two base stations, and let's say there are two mobiles. And the simplest thing is this, that both base stations will transmit on the link at the same time and frequency reuse, uh, at the uh, same time and frequency. So they'll uh, obviously, when this, uh, this uh, UE here will see that entire signal as interference, and this UE will see that signal as interference. And then the only thing you can try to do to improve the link is try to do power control. So you can increase the power on your link, which will improve your quality at the expense of the others by creating interference there. So the only game is power control. This, for reasons I'll make uh, uh, clear here, has become the dominant method for cellular systems. And that's because of the case that actually this is more optimal in the case when the interference is uh, weak. And that's become the dominant method for 3G and will continue to be the method, uh, dominant method for 4G cellular systems. The other type of method is what you could say is orthogonalization, which is actually a little easier to understand. All you do is that the two uh, transmitters transmit at on different resources, all right? So well, either in time or frequency. So here that the link, uh, so the, this blue link comes on one frequency resource and doesn't have any interference from this link. So that has no interference problem, but of course what you're doing is you're sacrificing bandwidth, that you only get half the bandwidth as opposed to this, but you got the full amount of bandwidth. So a lot of the questions then, and that's really, you could sum what it says abstractly, although it's often not viewed that way, is really the way that things like dot .11 uh, technologies work. We'll see that what we're going to see here is that femtocells cells really um, don't fit neatly into one of these two categories. And what's really needed is some kind of sophisticated hybrid scheme. And that's what I'll talk about here. Now, to get an idea of when to use one another, it's interesting just to look at a couple of different interference um, scenarios. So let's take a what you can uh, let's take a look let's take a look at a few types the first one I want to do is look at the interference in a macrocellular situation so this is obviously the, the interference is very environmentally dependent so all you can do is run simulations and it's accurate as you know as accurate as simulation model is but let's take a look at a few simulations so one part here is this model here is a, uh, what's a typically used in the studies of uh, macrocellular environments and you this is kind of imagine an ideal placement of a base station. So it's this perfect hexagon, and then with the perfect sectorization where the uh, cell sectors are perfectly aligned and so on. So that's, you know, that's this one model, you know, what the, you could look at the interference situation you can get from here. So that's kind of a model of what you would see in a traditional macro network. So let's deviate from that in two ways. The first way is you could imagine an unplanned deployment. Let's just imagine that I deploy the cells randomly, and let's look at the interference conditions here. The second part is, instead of this macro environment, let's look at a femtocell environment. So this is the femtocell um, uh, environment that's used in a lot of the 3GPP studies. You have a bunch of apartments, which are 10 meter by 10 meter, and about half of them, let's say, have a femtocell in them. So that red line is one end of that is a femtocell transmitter, and the other is a receiver. So that's a link going on in this uh, connection here. Now, the important part about this is this concept of restricted association. So you always, as the assumption here, is connect to the femtocell in your own apartment, because that's your femtocell. Even if that might, even though there's a wall here, it's often the case that that may not be the closest base station. There might be, you know, might be just on the other end side of the wall, right? There may be a closer base station, but you still won't connect to that. So let's see what happens. Let's first look at what happens when you un make the un deployment unplanned. So one of the common things that you know, cellular engineers look at is these interference or what are called geometry CDFs. So the x-axis here is the SINR, the signal to interference and noise ratio. So it's a measure of the amount of interference that the link is seeing. So this is the way you imagine all the links transmit at the same time. You may not choose to do this, but let's say that you did. Right? If all the links transmit at the same time, and then you could look at your signal power over the sum of all the interferences that you get. That's the SINR. All right? And then you get a, and now that's a random variable because it depends on randomly of where you are. And this is its CDF. So if you look here at the degradation just going from this perfect hexagon to this random environment, you see already about a 2 dB loss. 
Now, T2B loss is not insignificant. That's about, what, maybe 70%? So you've already potentially, not 70, about 30%. So that's about a 30% loss in capacity just from uh, not having an um, ideally deployed environment. When you go to a femtocell situation, you get a much more radically different uh, uh, interference situation. And it's sort of, there's good news and bad news. Here's the good news. So the good news is that there are many links, actually, which have very, very good SNR, all right? You know, over you know, as much as like 20 dB. When the radio probably can't even benefit from more than about 25 dB, so you're about the limit here, all right? That's because, of course, you know, these apartments are relatively isolated, like maybe this link over here is isolated, so it gets a very good SNR, all right? So that's many links. But there are some links which are really very bad, all right? Down to what maybe, uh, you could say about 8% or something are down around minus 10 dB. Now, you might think, okay, well, what's so bad about that? It's just a small number of links. But remember this. Imagine you were using your laptop. You're not going to remember the 60 70% of times that your laptop was really good. If you ever, you know, one out of 10 times you use your laptop and it completely fails, you're going to remember that. So that's the actual, uh, that's the issue here. Even if it's a small percentage, that's the part that we really need to uh, address. So there's, the big difference you see here is that there's a much larger number of links in a much worse interference condition. And that's coming primarily from this fact of the cell selection, right? That is this restricted association that you cannot connect to the strongest uh, cell. So this is where we see the big difference in the interference environment is when we do this kind of graph. Now, maybe just to, what I'll do is I'm going to skip over all of this. OK, well, now let me just take a couple of slides here. So let's take a look at where power, let's, I said there were two methods to try to deal with the interference. One is power control and the other is orthogonalization. So when you look at power control, it has actually been a very effective method in the cellular environment. All right. This is a graph, this is an algorithm that I worked on, but you know, there's a gazillion algorithms out there and there's many deployed in commercial uh, systems here. So if you look at the rate CDF, actually, all right, so when you run these algorithms, you look at the rate CDF, you can see a couple of different aspects. First of all, that the rates are actually quite good that you can get. So this is, um, this is what they usually measure in bits per second per hertz per user. So with 10 users, you know, your average user is getting about maybe, uh, your median user is getting maybe around 0.15 bits per second per hertz, about 1.5 bits per second per hertz, which is actually a very good capacity. That means on like a 10 megahertz system, you'd be getting running an average capacity of around 15 megahertz, which is extremely good in a loaded cellular system. So you know, power control has been very effective about getting the median rate. It's also very good about getting even the minimum rate that users get can be, uh, can be uh, managed quite well. So there's, and it's essentially the fact that there's no user in a very bad interference, in interference condition. If the interference condition's bad, you can do, but you can do uh, another thing about these power control algorithms. There's a lot of mathematical theory about them. And then you can have systematic methods which try to improve by changing what's called the utility function of these users and improve their interference condition so that you can you know, boost up the uh, rates for the lower mobiles at the expense of mobiles at the higher end. So, I mean, that means, I mean, the uh, coordination systems need to send signals to the phantom cell base, basically says how much power That's you right. should use. Exactly. And then, basically, that coordination will help to improve the interference. That's right. I don't have time to go into it, but that's exactly it. Mm -hmm. right? But then that's all, all that uh, uh, transfer of information is already what part of the specs in these 3G and 4G cellular systems and, and work well for power control. I mean, but this coordination, uh, is it need additional information? For example, do you need the location of those phantoms? Well, you don't typically do the location. What you do is you measure, do I have this slide on it? Yeah, oh no, I didn't. I, I have them back up. But what you do is you, the mobiles make reports, so they listen to the other base stations and say, this base station is 5 dB weaker than the base station to me. And so you get these kind of path ratios. And you send them, you keep on reporting them to your base station. So it, it, measures, it doesn't matter your geographical location, well, it's not what's relevant anyway. What matters is your actual uh, path, relative location in terms of path loss. And those are always measured by the uh, mobiles, and they're constantly reporting that to these. So when, once you start talking on your cell phone, it'll be constantly making those reports to the base station. So it, and that's how you can do the power control. And there's lots of other signals to do the power control signaling. I only have like a little while, so I'm not going to go into it. But that's all there. But if you, the problem is that when you try to run these power control into a uh, femtocell situation or just any kind of local area system, they kind of fail. So here's the rate CDF, all right? So remember, so this is the uh, CDF. So um, and this is the rate that you get. It's under some model, all right? But imagine that this is bits per second per hertz. So if this was a 10 megahertz, then two would mean 20 megahertz, all right? So that would be a very high rate. Um, so this is the situation, the blue curve, the situation of just all the links transmit a maximum power, all 
right? There's no power control, it's the simplest thing. Right? And you'll see here there are many links, all right, again, that you know, 10, 15% getting virtually no rate. Right. Now, what happens when you try to do some kind of optimal power control? So you say, okay, I have some link in very bad power. I'm going to try to decrease the power on the other link to make a trade-off so it can get less interference. And you can play around different games on how you do that trade-off. by trade -off. But the reality is none of those cur curves really budge that very much. Now, they budget a little bit, but really it's, uh, it's not helping out the situation. So there's still a lot that are suffering in a very bad interference condition. Now, so now the reason why it's failing is, again, is that power control is fundamentally works well when the interference is limited. All right. To illustrate that point, let's take a look here back to what you know, information theorists call what the Gaussian interference channel. Let's take a look of two links. All right. There's one transmitter and one receiver, another transmitter and another, uh, another receiver. But they interfere with one another, and this term alpha represents a kind of crossover game. All right. So this guy here will get some power P, and they'll have a noise uh, uh, n, and they'll have an uh, interference alpha p. And let's look at compare two things. One is reuse one. So we'll just assume here, we don't even bother with the power control aspect. Just assume that they both transmit at the same time and they treat the other interference as noise. All right? And that's been the dominant model for cellular systems. The other is that I could imagine orthogonalization. Right? I could just say that, well, I'm just going to split these two links. They'll each transmit on half the resources, either half time, half frequency, and uh, then they'll put twice the power on that. Right? So those are your two options. If you do this, you can look at the rates. And the rate you get will be a function of this crossover gain, this alpha. So what you get is that if the alpha is very low, all right, that means that the, uh, the weeks are interfering. The blue curve is the reuse one, the rate. And the green curve is the orthogonal. So let's look at the blue curve. When the interference is very low, obviously the reuse one does very well. But then as the interference increases, of course, it goes down in rate. At some point, it would be better to switch over and just put them onto orthogonal, onto two orthogonal links. So this is the sort of high-level conclusion of this very simple uh, calculation. When there's strong interference, you want to orthogonalize, and when it's weak interference, you want to uh, do reuse one. And that makes sense of why cellular systems have worked well with reuse one, because the interference tends to be low because of the proper cell selection. Um, now, actually, historically, reuse one wasn't always used. It was only used, actually, at the beginning of CDMA systems. 2G systems, and that, because they enabled a concept that you could spread the spectra interference across the whole band and get an averaging property, so you would see the average. But prior to that, actually, the dominant way was to using reuse, like what we call reuse three, right, or something like that. And that was typically used in conjunction with sectorization. So you would sectorize your antenna, so like this, and then you would put your, the signal power on three different frequencies, all right? And now, for example, the green frequency here here won't interfere with the uh, blue and red. But of course, what you're doing is you're limiting the amount of bandwidth. You're cutting the bandwidth down to a third. If you look at this um, here, does it actually improve the situation? And you can see here why it hasn't uh, worked well in the cellular environment. All right? um, while you get a, actually an interference gain here, the amount of rate increase is fairly small. And that's because you're sacrificing that one third of the bandwidth. All right? There's a small gain for people who have very bad interference, but the bulk of users actually suffer quite a bit, a large number of users. Let me just flip over. Um, when you look at OFDMA, all right, um, what's happened here is that the, uh, um, it's actually what you're seeing in, in OFDM technology when you move to 4G systems, they've actually seen a mixture of uh, uh, interference. So what's happened is that you have, what here, uh, maybe I should just quickly dive in OFDM, what you have is that you allocate, you divide the signal into different times and frequency slots. Within a cell, you can allocate users to disjoint parts of the spectrum. So example, these two different blue users are getting disjoint, so they don't interfere with one another. So they're orthogonalized. And then you can imagine in-cell interferences tends to be high, so this is good. On the other hand, out-of-cell interference, you randomly hop the locations of the interference of these uh, users within the cell. So they see kind of an averaging of the interference, so you get a, get a reuse one type of interference outside the cell. Does that, did I lose anyone in that? Okay. Let me just flip because I haven't gone to any of the new part here. Let me just go to this. So if you look at the sort of a you know historical perspective here on what's happened with reuse, early 2G systems used to be orthogonal. With the advent of CDMA, they went through reuse one because fundamentally that got a much higher efficiency because for the most part the interference was weak enough to uh, was weak enough that you would get a benefit. So both for the in cell and out of cell interference. For OFDMA systems. They got a kind of a best of both worlds. For the out-of-cell interference, they could use reuse one. And, but for in-cell interference, they could get orthogonal. Wi-Fi systems, which I didn't have a, a chance to talk about, are really just generally orthogonal, period. 
because they tend to, you have no condition of what the interference is, and they just carry a sense of mechanisms. As soon as you detect any kind of transmission, you shut down. So they tend to be orthogonal. So as a result, Wi Fi systems tend to be simple and robust, but you get a very poor spatial reuse. All right, but you have lots of spectrum, so maybe it doesn't matter. The problem with femtosols is that all these kind of systems are based on certain design assumptions, which you know, which were always which are valid under a regularly planned network. But what happens in a femtocell situation? In a femtocell situation, we saw here that reuse one does not work well in a small percentage, but small but significant percentage, because the assumptions break down. If we went to an all orthogonalized system, then we'd have the problems that you have with Wi-Fi, which is very poor spatial reuse. So you need some kind of method, which is a hybrid, and that will motivate does this last part of the talk here. So what LTE and 4G systems have done in general is kind of done a, a, offered a way to do a kind of hybrid scheduling, and what we call subband scheduling. In this case, you can divide the bandwidth into a bunch of subbands, which I've illustrated here. And the base stations can put different levels of power on different subbands. And now you can offer subbands at different uh, types. You can have subbands which are, say, exclusively used by one base station for orthogonal users. You can also offer base uh, subbands which are used by both base stations. Now, as a result, what happens is you can schedule users in different parts of the subbands. Mobiles that are not experiencing much interference can be scheduled into one of these reuse one subbands, where they, you know, they can actually benefit, while mobiles at the edge of the cell can then get scheduled on one of these other subbands. Now, subband scheduling is not that valuable in the macrocellular environment because the macrocellular environment, because it's already orthogonal in cell, get benefits almost gets almost everybody else you want to do in reuse one. But this can be very valuable in the femtocell situation. In the femtocell situation, what we want to do is some kind of, you could think of distributed optimization to try to properly select the subbands and try to assign users to the correct uh, subbands. So you, you can try to you can think of some kind of distributed optimization. I'm not going to have a chance to go over this. Would you use a utility based uh, uh, metric for this? But then it's sending that, in, uh, that metric in some kind of distributed way. Now, because it's distributed here, because, well, of course, the selections of subbands in one base station will affect the uh, subbands in the other situation. When you run that algorithm, here's where you can start to see the gains. The blue line, again, was when all the mobiles were transmitting the same power. And the green line was transmitting with power control, got it a little better, but you can get a much more significant gain here by doing this kind of uh, power, by doing some kind of subband uh, uh, scheduling. And that, by, because what you can do, of course, if the few mobiles that are suffering very badly, you can then go and assign them uh, dedicated subband where they're not seeing any interference and get their interference condition up a lot better. All right. That was just a brief talking about what you know, happens with femto to femto cell interference. Let me just quickly talk about what happens in the femto to macro case. Now, the femto to macro case is that it creates a lot of uh, problems. They're, uh, logistically, doing femto to macro cell uh, interference coordination is difficult. For one part, it's just a scalability issue. When you want, it's not really feasible for the femtocell, um, large macro cells serving hundreds of mo mobiles and with potentially hundreds of femtocells in its thing to try to coordinate individual interference subbands with any of these parts. It's not going to say, you know, the one tiny little femtocell over here, I'm going to vacate the subband over you for, you know, which is going to affect all my subscribers here. There's also just, you know, a hearability issue that you know, the, the signal, there's a huge power disparity in the signals, so it's actually just very hard to, or at least over the air, to communicate any kind of signaling quickly between the femtocells in a short range communication and a large and a macrocellular environment. The second part is that even if the macrocell could hear you, it probably would never want to yield traffic. Macro capacity, as we said, is very expensive. It takes a lot of effort. The operator is never going to give away capacity of the macro cell to try to serve just some small femtocell capacity. So ideally, you really want technologies that operate under the radar of macro. Now, I wanted to say this because this is sort of the perspective, in a way, a kind of dynamic version of cognitive spectrum sharing. You know, cognitive spectrum sharing you could think of as a slow time scale orthogonalization. When the primary user occupies the spectrum, all the short range communication is shut off. When it drops, you uh, when it drops, then the short range community is detected and can come on. What we what we need for femtocells is something like that, but we'd actually like both operating simultaneously, but the short range still running under the radar of the under the radar of the uh, uh, primary user, which is the macro cell. You can do that trick doing subband scheduling. How can we do that? Let's take a look. Suppose we divide, take the subband scheduling. As we said, we'll imagine we divide it again into what we said, reuse one subbands and reuse three subbands. 
all right? So we use one subband that typically serving mobiles that are close to the cells. So this color picture is, imagine on the right is a blue base station, and the left is a green base station, right? So their power is kind of radiated here. The reuse one subbands, both base stations are transmitting, and they're serving mobiles who are close to them. So the blue mobiles are being served by the blue base station, and green by the green base station. So obviously what can happen here is that in the reuse one subband, statistically, there will be very few in the middle of the cell. So if your link is at the edge of the cell, you could kind of transmit here, you could imagine, a short range link in the, between these two subbands without affecting the mobiles at the edges, uh, mobiles uh, close to the cell. Because statistically, you should be far apart. This is coming at much lower power here. And anyway, you're not seeing much interference from this guy because you're very, it's very far away. And you're not going to have much effect on the mobiles here. On the other hand, if you end up in the unfortunate situation where you're close to the base station, that's not either bad either. Because the close base station will have reused three subbands. And those subbands here will be serving mobiles at the edge, the edge of the cell. So if you can run. On one of those subbands, this, like on this one, the green base station is using, so the blue base station is not even using it. So if you're close to it, then you just go ahead and transmit your short range signal there. Does that picture make sense? Did I lose everyone on this picture? Or is it too many colors? <laughs> <laughs> OK, there are two base stations. There's a green base station and a blue base station. All right. There's the blue mobiles being served by the blue base station, the green mobiles being served by the green base station. They're the squares. The red lines are your short range links, right, which are not getting served by either, by the base stations. They just have to transmit without affecting any of this other communication. I, I, I just get confused on uh, basically the short range links. What are the uh, basically tricks you are using to basically make sure the Basically, the powerful signals from the base station that are So So this part here, I'm doing nothing smart. Okay. All, all I'm doing is just saying, well, as long as the signal's weak enough. OK. So what's going to, imagine that I'm very far away from both the base stations. Okay. So then hopefully the signal's weak enough. I can transmit a little above that signal. And then I'm not going to I'm affect not going to it. Interfere okay. with There's nothing smart other than that. Yeah, right. I just re measure the received power and I measure the receive power, and then I say, if I uh, look at how much power I need to transmit above that to get a decent rate, and if I'm far enough away from every other mobile, then go ahead and test. Right? And I can be far enough away because, okay, so, and I'll be far enough away because in this subband here, I'll be, uh, those, those mobiles will be close to the base station. Right? So that's the, that's the idea. On the other hand, if you're close to the base station, that's not so bad either, because what you do is if you're close to the base station, there are sub subbands which the uh, cellular network will have all kept open for serving its low edge of cell mobiles. Okay. With its edge of cell mobiles, it'll serve, because this mobile wouldn't be scheduled here, because if it was scheduled here, it would see a lot of interference between the, it would see a weak signal from the green base station and a, you know, an equal power signal from the blue station. So you'll serve that uh, cell here. This subband is one where the green base station only transmits. The blue base station is off. So you can trans, if you land up close to the blue stage, you just run your short range link here. All right, because you're not even seeing any signal from the base station, so you won't affect it. And presumably the green mobile will be far away. Similarly, if you're close to the blue base station, you transmit here. So if you're close to the blue, you transmit here. You're close to the green, you transmit here. You're close to neither, you transmit here. All right, so it's somewhere for you to transmit, wherever you go. All right, now, a little part about science fiction here. You can even do better than this using something called interference cancellation. Interference cancellation is this. If it's very strong, actually, the interference, you can first decode it, subtract it off, and then transmit underneath that. That opens up a couple more plates on this color-coded graph. If you're very close to, if you're at the edge of the cell here, imagine on the uplink, right? In the uplink, this guy will be transmitting at very high power to reach its base station. So you can very clearly hear this guy's base, uh, signal. You can then subtract it off and then transmit underneath his signal. Okay. If you believe the science fiction, you can do this. All right? um, on the other hand, if you're at the edge of the cell, you can actually, of course, if you're at the edge of the cell, like, you can always transmit here because there's no signal. But you can also transmit when you're, then this base station signal is very strong. Because you'll hear on the downlink, you'll see a very strong signal from the base station. So you can then decode that signal and subtract it off. All right? Now, of course, for interference cancellation to work, you have to have, this has to be a decodable signal, means that the rate has to be relatively low so you can decode it. But anyway, this is serving edge of cell mobiles. So anyway, the rate tends to be very low. 
because uh, so and which is which will be decodable. So you can just make this so that these are so you'll tend to be able to decode the uh, uh, data here. When you add all that up, yeah. Interference cancellation is basically a hot topic in basic theory, basically. Yes. Right, and there have been there's basically people working on that. Now, what are the assumptions basically in the interference cancellation, and how much as an assumption can be implemented in the real world? Okay, so the interference cancellation just really the actually it's already there are Qualcomm when I was there was already producing chips which did interference cancellation interference avoidance is another issue okay. but interference cancellation is uh, you just the assumptions of course is that you have to be able to detect the assignment from the base station in this case so that part you just have to put the assignment in some publicly decodable part it has to be at a rate that's low enough that you can decode all right first. So you know that you're trying to do a very high rate to that user. It'll be you'll need a very good channel quality, and it'll be harder to decode. All right. So again, you have to lower the rate. That's easy. And then you need hardware to actually do this. The hardware is a bit of a problem, especially it's really you know I've been through the ASIC part of this part, and you need really the bottleneck is actually the memory to get that. And that's because in a cellular system you have this thing called hybrid ARQ where you have to. Um, remember codes and then try to decode them and stuff. Okay. But the memory is actually becoming, you know, reasonable as well. You know, at least for these cellular systems. So that's it's entirely feasible to do this. So let me try to repeat my understanding yeah. more with basically your information. So basically, for the interference cancellation, uh, the receiver will need to try to uh, be able to decode two signals. One is the strong yes. London signals, yes. which is basically, I mean, from far away, basically stronger base stations. Then the uh, basically intended signal actually comes from yes. the receiver, right? right? So basically, you do you try to do decoding twice. Exactly. Right. I mean, basically, first strip up for yes. the stronger one, and basically then the okay, yep. and the lower ones. Exactly. Okay. So when you add this all, if you believe this is a very preliminary uh, uh, simulation here, um, when you add this up, you get this potentially huge amount of capacity. So this is in bits per second. So if you have a 10 megahertz system, the median user can get what maybe 25 megabits for free almost. There's some minimal assumption of some minimal effect on the macro, right? So like 25 megabits for free, sitting underneath the radar of the fa of the fa and then with the interference cancellation that boosts up to around like 35 megabits. So there's actually so this you know is, I think interesting just from also for people looking at cognitive spectrum about a different way of thinking about how to share a spectrum that's maybe not. So, uh, with just a, so simple, just a simple either or kind of situation, that there's a lot of capacity on. Um, let me just talk a little about, uh, if I have to, you know, I can talk about this later. Maybe I'll just wrap it up right now. Um, we'll talk about the test bed uh, plans that I have for Poly about trying to build a wireless. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> Sorry to keep you here for it.